Hey, and welcome to the Courtney Turner Podcast. I'm your host, Courtney, and I'm super passionate about moving and thinking. On this show, we are going to dive into all things health, fitness, personal development, lifestyle, and political sociocultural. I've always been fascinated by people and I love learning from the experiences and stories of others. This has been a treat for me and I hope this is enjoyable and useful for you. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or any way that I can make this a better experience for you, please don't hesitate to reach out. Hello, welcome to the Courtney Turner Podcast. I am back today with Max, known as Maximus Forever on Twitter. And today we were going to do a part two. A lot of people wanted to hear more about theology, which he is well versed in, and I am not so much. So it's going to be a real treat for me. I think I'm probably going to learn just as much as all of you. How are you doing today, Max? Hey, I'm doing fine. How are you doing, Courtney? Thanks for having me back on your show. This is going to be fun. Thank you. I'm super excited. Yeah. And I also didn't mention that uh, he does amazing seminars. We'll talk about that a little bit at the end, but you should definitely yeah. take it. The, all the things you never learned in school, but should have. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's the truth, right? It's the truth. Well, civics and, and history are dead in American schools. They, they teach alternative history and civics isn't even taught anymore. It literally is not taught anymore. So, yeah, no, literally it isn't taught anymore. And, uh, you know, I'm a little cynical. I kind of think it's by design, but whether it is or not, Carl Jung used to say that if you want to know the intention of something, look at the outcome. And I think we have, uh, we just look at the outcome. It's not, not for the better. So, yeah, yeah. That's, that's true. But, um, you know, I was just, uh, I was just uh, thinking uh, that you do love philosophy. So when you said Carl Jung, I started last month. <laughs> so that's your thing. You're, philo- you're into philosophy, you know. Philosophy, psychology. I started college as a neuroscience major. In high school, I wrote 285 page thesis on dream analysis. My high school actually published it. So, oh. so psychology, philosophy. Yeah. My, yeah. my, there, my jam. But you know there is you're right though and he and it, it there is a design to eliminate civics from school and i think that it's 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 part of the the it's part of the strategy of the far left and and it's all inherently part of cultural marxism and yes. uh, you know a lot of it's not something that we make up it's not something that on the right is some sort of conspiracy theory this is a long-term process to basically redefine uh american civilization uh you know and 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 in the mind of you it know is. I mean, it is it, it right? through exactly. interdirectional conditioning and long range penetra- long range penetration and yes, that's yes. that is really the name of the game with cultural marxism that that that's what they've done and it's been in this country it's been well over a century but they, oh, yeah. they've been playing this game you know outside this country for longer so yeah i, I mean i get I get questions from some of the uh, some of the people that attend my my uh, seminars, and uh, one of them was asking me what can I do. His daughter was going to be going off to uh, to a university uh, next year, and you know he was worried about you know it, I think it was the university she was choosing or what have you. And I, uh, I, you know, I, I mean, I, my suggestion is if you want them to, everybody should get a higher education, get higher education in some format. I mean, I, we should bring back vocational schools in the way they did, you know, 60, 70, 80 years ago, they were popular in my grandparents and great grandparents day. But, um, you know, I mean, I believe in, in higher education. I, I obviously pursued it. I went to liberal schools. Um, I didn't have a problem with it. Uh, but, you know, I mean, if a, I, I've run into families and parents that are concerned about their kids' education when they get to that higher, of course, and you can choose a conservative university. There are a couple out there. Um, there you know, there's like three. But... Yeah, there is. There's like three, right? That's two or three. I was gonna, I was gonna say two, but yeah, okay. You know, but you know, there is. But you know, honestly, I mean, um, other than going to an outright, downright, flaming liberal school, for the most part, they're going to be exposed to it. I think if they're your child's rooted in your conservative values in your household and they are pretty firm in it, it can actually, you know, it can actually beef them up a little bit by going and having to defend that, that their premises and well, on a university. That's my perspective anyway. It, that, that's an interesting perspective. I mean, I, if, you know, my thoughts on it are that they have done part of the cultural Marxist game or, you yeah. know, so whoever that there are many angles of that cultural Marxist wing, but I think one of the strongest units that they've tried to destroy is the family. And I think yeah, that yeah. the values stem from family. And that's really what it's about. It's about 
and then they want to destroy any extension of the family. And this will bring us to our topic today because religion and, uh, you know, religious communities are mm-hmm. exen- essentially, they are an extension of the family. And I think mm-hmm. that that's a huge part of why it's so important for them to infiltrate them and tear them from within. Because if you think about having, uh, you know, a lot of your morals and your values do come from you know somewhat they come from within but a lot of them come from initially from family and then they can be reinforced from your extended communities whether that be through your religious communities or your you know even just local communities but I think it's really hard not to say that it can't be done but it's really hard for someone to stand in their integrity and their own and follow their moral compass with no support and they know this and that is why they want to tear these institutions down because it's much easier to uh, sway someone and you know thereby control them or manipulate them to your their own gains uh, for whatever purposes if they don't have that support. Um, yeah, so. and, you know, and, and well put. And the fact is that in this country here, it has been, I mean, we're experiencing social degradation so society is we, we discussed this a little bit in the or a lot actually i think in the first podcast yeah. and that i did with you and uh so you know we're, we're actually declining slowly it's a decline and fall of the united states and actually the decline and fall of western civilization yes. and, and as I, I you already know i'm a declinist so i tend to look at everything is in decline and there people ask me this in the seminars all this when we do in civics is because we get to the towards the end of of uh, my civics one maximus 101 which is the first uh, basics i do on, um, when i teach um, civics to people and uh you know they ask me it's like what can we do can it can it turn around what have you and like i told you the last time i don't really see it i see i see things as just getting progressively worse but one of the reasons why uh we are faced with this is because of the institutions, the learning institutions themselves have become these humanistic, extremely hyper-secular uh, institutions where at one time when you used to go to a university you know, 800 years ago, you'd be going there to primarily to get a religious, a religious education or at least uh, your Judeo-Christian values would be meshed with uh, you know, classical, if you would, Greco-Roman uh, values. And you'd be going there to, in a sense to become a priest or you were a member of a, a royal household. So you had to be the head of the state, which meant you were the head of the church or mm-hmm. you were responsible for the mores of, of the society in some right. way. Uh, now they just go to the process children and, and, and turn them into these you know, raving, you know, disrespectful, um, hyperactive, you know. Whack, well, whack it, 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 that's a really interesting Citizens. point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. So sorry, I'm, 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 I'm finished. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I, I was just saying, I think it's a really interesting point because I don't think it's the, um, you know, it's not the uh, lack of religion itself uh, mm-hmm. that causes so much destruction. I think it's what it gets filled by because mm-hmm. as human beings, I don't think we are capable of having a complete void of believing in something higher. You know, mm-hmm. people need to believe in some sort of universal moral ideal, whether that be, you know, for good or, or not. And yeah. it is if they don't have it, you know, it's like Nietzsche said, you know, God is dead and we have killed him. And then mm-hmm. I, I'm going to butcher the rest of the quotes, but it, you know, it's about what, how will we save our, you know, murderous souls. <laughs> um, right. And really, you know, I think a lot of people do misinterpret what that was about, but it, it is about what that society had killed him. And then what is going to happen thereafter mm-hmm. is destruction. And it's not, the, it, it's not just the loss of the religion alone. This is my view, um, but it's because then what gets filled by that? Because people are not capable of just, you know, living in just the here and now. Um, yeah. And I, I want that to, I just want to qualify that. I don't necessarily mean that to, there's lots of ways that can be interpreted, but I actually really mean that very literally. You know, that's why people are, if you look at it psychologically speaking, people are prone to anxiety and depression. And the, the reason for that is because they're caught up in future thinking or they're caught up in, you know, past thinking. And it is really hard as human beings because we do have a history that's part of our historicity and our makeup. And then we have the future to contend with. And, you know, unless we have some sort of solace in a greater belief, 
then we're going to be filled with some sort of uh, despair or anxiety. So yeah, it's true. And that's where uh, faith comes in. And so and people are, you know, taught uh, that there is no place for Christ and the church in our common discourse anymore. There is it's, it's a separate it's a wall of separation between church and state. They keep saying, even though it's not in the Constitution, it's not in the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. um, that's part of a letter. Uh, mm -hmm. that Thomas Jefferson wrote that's completely on you know it was never let it was never legislated it was never mm -hmm. signed into law by a president it was read into the constitution in a court decision by the supreme court the ever the ever the ever liberal warren court uh back in the 1960s and uh and people just accepted that and so the bible and and uh and faith and judeo christian values are now out i mean you think about it when we are i mean can i mean just stop and think that Think about these judges. I mean, how in their honest, in their minds, can they possibly think that putting up the Ten Commandments in a public school in some way is bad? I mean, how could you come draw to that conclusion that thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not murder? These are inherent, basic, fundamental values of humanity. All yeah. civilizations, all religions subscribe to them one way or another. These are universal truths, and you're sticking them up there, and because they're in Hebrew usually, or in, traditionally, or if they're in English, they're up there, and you're putting them in a public school, and in some way, that's an endorsement of religion, and the founding fathers meant that not to happen, which doesn't make any sense, because we don't hear about any of that until the 1960s. So, I mean, it's a lie. <laughs> in absolutely. <laughs> And I, I really want to just to highlight something you said, because it is about Judeo-Christian values. That That's does right. not, you know, I think one of the things that people who argue against religion and against religious teaching, uh, you know, they say we have freedom from religion. Yes, you have freedom to believe your own personal faith or lack thereof mm -hmm. is that that is sacrosanct. You are mm -hmm. entitled and you are uh you know, very fortunate in this country to have that freedom. That mm. does not mean that this country was not founded and predicated upon the Judeo-Christian values. The values were literally woven within to our founding documents. They're inseparable. It's inseparable. I mean, the yeah. Declaration of Independence cites so many different biblical violations in it. It's the way Jefferson's phrasing it. You have to kind of read it and then know the Bible a little bit, but mm. it's there. Um, it, it references the creator or God six times. It's talking about yeah. the Christian Jude, or the Jewish Christian, I should say the Judeo-Christian God. Judeo That's what it's referencing, considering the origin of the men, the men who wrote it. And, it, you know, they weren't shying away from this. These are universal truths. So, you know, I, I mean, go ahead. I, I, I don't I don't want to keep cutting you off, but no, um, no, no. yeah. yeah. You know, it's just that the, the the these are things that was accepted by our our founders, and for them to it's a lie that's just it's always bet us that you know there there's this wall of separation and that the Christianity and that you know, there's no place in in our discourse and they shouldn't be we can't have because they take the First Amendment where it says you know Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment or religion so right. you can't have an endorsement of, of of religion that was to prevent a state church exactly. It didn't, it didn't mean for a moment that people could not, and it even says, the second clause goes, nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So people have the right to freely, freely speak of Jesus Christ all they want, talk about him, stand on a street corner, whatever. They can do it from either, they could do it from behind their desk in, on Capitol Hill if they're a member of Congress, or they can do it on a street corner like an evangelist and be talking about him. There's nothing, the Constitution allows that type of freedom of expression. It's just saying to, the, to Congress, you can't make a state church because the founders knew how bad of a thing that was going back to to the middle ages it was terrible when you had state states uh state religion because then people couldn't they couldn't freely express what they thought about exactly. uh, what their interpretations were of the scripture they knew the history of the protestant reformation so that's what they were referencing back to in that in that uh in that amendment but um and by the way it's not freedom uh from religion it's freedom um it's fr uh, fr uh, uh it's freedom of religion the right for you to freely right. express your religious beliefs and one of the things too that i've often pointed out to people and it throws them a curve sometimes is the fact that i look at atheism as just another religion when you think about it it's just a system of tenets that people subscribe to so they just accept that science can become a religion to people Absolutely. Like usually, the, the left I, usually blow up when you say that but i'm a no scientist. i think it's absolutely true I, I, yeah good 
Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I kind of see there's so many things that are like, there's religious elements to this COVID, you know, there's rituals and there's, yep. you know, yeah, you, anything that, and that was my point. My point is people need something to believe. And yep. it, I absolutely agree with you. Atheism has a lot of uh, religious components. It is a, because just as much as one may argue, and this is something I'd actually really like to ask you about. I'm very curious yeah. your thoughts on this. So a lot of people argue, well, there's no proof that there is God. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's, and people may have their opinions on this, but it's pretty hard to say, you know, uh, that there's a you know, concrete, tangible, but the same can be true for the converse. I mean, do you have evidence that there isn't? That's pretty hard to prove as well. And that requires a leap of faith. And so that's where the, the religious component of atheism actually comes in, because mm -hmm. for you to believe that vehemently, that's not an agnosticism, that's a, a staunch belief that there absolutely cannot be any uh, deistic uh, presence, that's a, a leap of faith, because you don't have any evidence to present that. You may not have okay. evidence to pr prove the contrary, but you don't have evidence to prove that either. So well, if you're somebody faith. So, yeah. So when someone says there's no proof that God exists and so, yeah, you're absolutely right, but there's no proof that he doesn't exist. Right. So you're coming from the idea that I have to show the burden of proof. No, you have to show me proof that he doesn't exist. Which is what science is supposed to be predicated on, right? <laughs> burden right. of proof. You, you can't, <laughs> yeah. I mean, they can't. So what they do is they start talking about the origin of the universe and they can trace everything back to the Big Bang. Right, right, which is like the, the 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 beginning of the universe, right? But they can't tell you exactly how something came out of nothing, right. and so and that that requires faith, and pretty much all of this requires faith because scientifically speaking, nobody was there to observe it. You can't recreate it in a laboratory per se. Now right. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to argue. I'm not, I'm not arguing against um, the geological age of the Earth and stuff, and we'll get to that in a second because I, I do believe in that the Earth is is billions of years old. It's probably like 4.6 billion years old. Mm -hmm. But um, the thing is that when they start talking about the existence of God, well, you're talking about again, it's just a matter of of, of faith, and it's a spirit. It's a matter of spiritual conscience. So people people subscribe to this. Uh, but you can't disprove the existence of God either. And all you can do through science anyway is just you're telling me about creation. That's how I'm going to view it. So you're telling me how everything came to be. But you can only go back so far. You admittedly, the scientists will say, I can only go back this far and I can't go back any farther. And I can say to you, well, but in another in another plateau, in another in another if you would another dimension, I could I could say my faith tells me that there was this being that had everything come into existence, that brought everything into existence. So that's where that's where um, that's where my faith comes in. And he'll go, I can't, or she'll go, I can't. Uh, you can't prove that. Yeah, but you can't disprove it. So it's like that question that I remember this from years ago. Um, so I remember hearing someone say once that, uh, do you really want to take a chance that there is no God and die saying that that's there is wager. What? I'm sorry, say that again. That's Pasquale's wager. Oh, I didn't. Okay, I didn't know that. I, I heard so, I, I heard someone say this once, and and I was like, you know, I was taken back by it. It's like, yeah, yeah that's right. Can you honestly? Do you want to close your eyes and die denying the existence of God and denying Jesus Christ, or? I mean, can you really say, can you be 1000%? Can you assure me that we just go and become, we just go into oblivion, we just cease to exist? And no, they can't. They can't actually prove that to you. So it, it's just really, but we're on the defensive because they have the consensus, they say, which by the way, and just as something you can, and I know you, you, um, this, you like this, is that I am sick of tired of hearing about medical consensus and scientific consensus because consensus is a political term. <laughs> well, really and most scientists agree with the people who fund them. Yeah. We, okay. So you know, that's, <laughs> yeah. Follow the money. Follow the money, honey. That's what yeah. it comes down to. So it's like you know, but, but your no, review. Serious. You know, yeah. Who's funding that? <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's the consensus. But you know, yeah. uh, I just laugh because we know that that science changes. I mean, they, they just that they, they it's always updated. That's the definition of science is that it cannot right. be proven. Yeah. That's absolutely. yeah, it's pro we're progressing, we're progressing and we're always learning more. So certainly if you go back to Isaac Newton and you come up to Einstein, you come up to the present day, science is always improving its knowledge and it's acquiring more and more knowledge. So you can't say it's a be all end all is what we, we theories are always changing. They're always evolving. So, you know, but anyways, so 
Um, but it's, it's interesting to open up this uh, the segment and so uh, or this uh, our topic here was getting into theology. So this is the theology conversation that uh, that uh, that we promised everybody for the last. Yes. Month. So, so, so I'll ahead. just very quickly say, yeah, Pasquale's wager. So basically, you know, to act as if there though there is a God is the safer bet. That was the mm-hmm. that was the conclusion of his his bet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, and I would, and I, I agree, and I, I I definitely I've already accepted Jesus Christ as my personal savior. So you know, I'm I'm yeah. I, so I, bef- I, yeah, go ahead. before we go in, I I would love to hear that. The, what is your personal? As much as you want to share, I, because yeah. as I was saying, you know, when we open this, I think that the we are in very much, especially in this country, a more secular environment. As you said, they've taken it out of schools. A lot of people, I myself included, were not even given a religious education. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, my personal background, I don't know how much of my audience even knows this, but, you know, I grew up in a, by heritage, I'm Jewish. Uh, Mm -hmm. My dad was a hardcore atheist. Uh, Mm -hmm. My mom very much operates as, you know, she would like there to be a God and she, you know, acts as though there is. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was not raised with any kind of a, a background in mm-hmm. uh, theology or religious, uh, you know, uh, parochial type of uh, schooling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, I very much formulated my own kind of, uh, which mm-hmm. w- that's like a whole nother discussion, but, you know, it was very Perfect. spiritual uh, when I was nine and it was a turning point in my life. And uh, so I had a lot of, you know, beliefs that I came to because I don't think human beings can not come to some sort of something that they believe in. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm curious of what your background is, what you grew up with, how that's changed through the years. And then we can dive into teaching people who are not as versed. Well, you know, I so I was raised Pentecostal, classical Pentecostal, and um, my family. And that's a little unique because being Latin, most people think you're you're right away you're Catholic, right. and um, but I was raised Pentecostal, and uh, you know that's uh, Pentecostalism is uh, in the classical sense. It's 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 related to charismatics, and and uh, a lot of the your audience are probably may be familiar with both terms. They usually interchangeably. But um, Pentecostals are pretty much evangelical Protestants, and uh, they subscribe to the full gospel uh, of the scripture. The inherent word of God is, uh, is the scripture. It's God breathed, the Old and New Testaments. Uh, Jesus Christ is the son of God. He's the full expression of God. Um, he came here to save us of our sins. Um, believing in Jesus Christ uh, and accepting him as your Lord and personal savior is all that's required for salvation. Um, and, uh, and then we, as a Pentecost, it's pretty much a lot like, like Baptists believe in non, most mainstream non-denominationalists today. Um, but, uh, the only uh, difference I would say, that's probably the, I'd say it's probably the only really well-known difference is that Pentecostals also believe that, uh, in a separate act of, of, I guess you could call a separate act of sanctification or salvation, probably sanctification is a better way of putting it, is the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And uh, that comes from Acts 2, verses 1 through 4, and uh, Acts 19, verses 1 through 7. I think it's Acts uh, chapter 10, verses 44 to 46, where it's the three accounts in Acts. And, and the, the Pentecostal uh, movement, which is actually started in, uh, in 1906, um, traced its spiritual lineage, if you would, back to the first century church. Uh, that's why some of the early Pentecostals uh, out of Azusa Street in, in, in California, in Los Angeles, um, that's where it began uh, in earnest, uh, and many different denominations. And we're talking Baptists, we're talking Quakers, Presbyterians, Methodists, especially Methodist holiness. Um, you know, uh, Catholics, you name it, uh, went to Azusa Street, and you can look it up online. It's an interesting history, an interesting read, and it's spelled A Z U S A, if you would. Uh, street uh, that was the old Azusa Street mish- mission. And that's where the first Pentecostals, a really interesting history of early early 20th century uh, Pentecostalism. And, and specifically, this was a big part of what became the, the, the heart of l- later decades, the religious right movement. A lot of it came out of this movement. Um, and so, the, the, you know, it's it's kind of all interrelated. Uh, but uh, the, the thing is, what for Pentecostals, we believe if you're, you, you get baptized in, in the Holy Spirit when when you seek it, you have to seek it after you get saved. After you, you know, you get, you know, you seek the filling in the, the Holy Spirit, and then you'll start speaking in other tongues. That's the initial evidence of being uh, baptized in the Spirit. And that's what puts us at odds um, 
both as as Pentecostals and even many Charismatics, because they subscribe to it too, uh, and, and with all the other Christian denominations. So it puts us in a, in, a, in a different category. But it's a that's that's what I am. I'm I'm not ashamed of it. I tell everybody that when they ask me, and uh, you know, it's it's out there. And uh, but uh, we also believe in all the moving and all the gifts of the Spirit, healing, words of wisdom, uh, knowledge, you name it, prophecies. Um, there have been a lot of great uh, Pentecostal healing evangelists like Amy McPherson in California, uh, oh. who was extremely well known in her day. She she was like mainstream news. They would talk about her oh. uh, all the way down to, uh, you know, uh, people like um, A.E. Allen in the 1950s, R.W. Shambach, who was a disciple of his. Uh, Trended Broadcasting Network, who a lot of your viewers, uh, a lot of people that probably follow me, too, are familiar with TBN, as it's called, mm -hmm. um, the big yeah. religious network, was founded by Paul and Jan Crouch, who were Pentecostals. So uh, the, probably the most famous Pentecostal, I would say that's not, a lot of people don't realize he was a Pentecostal. He was Assemblies of God, which is one of the two big denominations, one of the two big churches of Pentecostalism. Um, that was actually uh, Elvis Presley. He was actually raised Assemblies oh. of God, and he left the faith to become a singer. And uh, but he was he was AG as they put it, um, born and raised. So you know, um, uh -huh. a lot of people think he was Baptist, but he wasn't. So um, you know, it's just little things like that. Anthony Quinn, the famous actor, was a was a, a, a actually a four square, I believe, uh, because his mother used to play the accordion. I think it was, or maybe it was the um, uh, maybe it was the piano at uh, Amy McPherson's healing uh, uh, revivals that she'd have. So it's, uh, it's it, and I only knew this because he was being interviewed by Robert Osborne once. It's a great interview if you can ever find it on YouTube with uh, on Turner Classic Movies. And Anthony Quinn was talking about this and uh, that, you know, he, he, he witnessed all these healings, people just getting up, you know, out of their, out of their wheelchairs and, and, uh, mm -hmm. That was where, that was our main line. That was uh, people think now they think of the televangelists and stuff, and um, they're an offshoot and uh, they're a descendant of that. But actually, if you go back, uh, you know, 120 years or 114 years, you hear read some of the, the stories that were just out in the press, and people were witnessing this stuff taking place, and it made itself into the mainstream news. So, can you imagine putting it on CNN? And they're talking about something like, I mean, it kind of like would be total like, you know, time warp. There's like something's wrong with this picture. But yeah, this stuff wasn't, this stuff was either you were, either they were being criticized or there was a lot of that that happened too. But they were also people that were witnessing uh, a lot of these things. So it's a, it's a fascinating history. Um, yeah. But uh, that's my background. My back, my background, my roots uh, religiously goes back to that. So did you grow up uh, very much immersed in the, you know, religion and yeah, I did. I actually grew up in, um, in, in the household like that. And uh, so, you know, my family was very, I have uh, ministers in my family and, mm -hmm. um, and going way back, you know, to my great grandparents. And so, you know, yeah, I grew up in that environment. And then when I decided to, um, you know, when I decided to actually go and uh, go back to school and get my degrees and everything, I picked a very secular subject, right? Because, I'm, <laughs> right. you know, I love history. I chose archaeology. Oh, you're going to become an anthropologist. And so, yeah, yeah I did. And uh, I hadn't, I didn't even think twice about it because I always loved history. Mm -hmm. I always loved uh, archaeology. Um, I, I, I got so disappointed uh, when I got my degree because I thought they were going to give me a fedora and bullwhip. And, you know, and I was just so like, <laughs> I was just like, I thought now that I got my degree, I was going to be running through the jungle and stuff like that. You <laughs> Indiana know? Jones, right? Yeah, I thought natives would be chasing me and stuff. And and uh, I felt so sad that, <laughs> um, you know, it wasn't the case, you know. And uh, I said, what's this? Where are the Nazis? They're supposed to be chasing me. I'm supposed to have this like golden idol in my hands and stuff. And and no, it's so boring. It's just I got to sit there and you're, you know, with little brushes and stuff and you're in the dirt all the time. And, you know, and then you're making little notes on pads like where and I'm waiting, like, when are you going to hear the music? Isn't like John Williams score supposed to be cute here at any times? And but no, but so I it was it's it's uh, archaeology, but archaeology is extremely fascinating. Yeah. And uh, it's not as romantic. It actually, you know, it's funny. I don't want to even say that there is a romance to it. I'm going to tell you when you you know, when you, depending on where you go in the world, which you do, there's, uh, there, there's, there is, there is a real romance with it because when you're holding an object in your hand that someone has not put their hands on for like, you know, oh, 1500 yeah. years, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. It's, it's a yeah. pretty cool feeling. And so, but you know, I went into, so I went into that and then I, I, I was, I went into classical history or, um, that's what 
they'll they'll call it in school these days. But I actually mm -hmm. took uh, I took uh, ancient history uh, with an mm -hmm. emphasis on on Rome, and uh, and then I uh, also took classical archaeology for my advanced degrees. Um, but um, you know, it it's uh, yeah, I did, and then I I ended up teaching, and I've taught you know all ages, and uh, you know, so it's uh, that's. But I mean, how do I? So I started rec. I've never had a problem with reconciling it. I just never mm. did it with my faith. I just never. There was never contention. In fact, I would find it interesting when people would be presenting to me things that members of my family would disagree with right off. You know, like mm -hmm. the Earth is uh you know um billions of years old and you know there were civilizations that date back to the you know when you, you're talking the paleolithic age for i mean you're, you're talking like you know you know 70,000 years ago 50,000 years ago so it, it's like you know um but nevertheless so most christians and I know because I, I mean, that's who I associate with. Mm -hmm. They have a, a, a young earth uh, view, that young earth creationist view. You know, the earth is only sick. If they think it, they, they, if they don't, re this is not a topic that's really discussed a lot. So it's because there's extremes to it. Young, young earth creation is pretty much, hey, it's 6,000 years old. And science, the scientific community goes, no, it's 4.6 billion years old. And neither side talks to each other. They just criticize each other. So, it, you know, I don't take either position, actually. So. Oh, I mean, really? not, 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 in, not in, not in its, not in its, uh, not in, a, in itself, uh, you know, as far as exclusively, I don't take either side directly. I, I believe that the earth is, uh, is for at least 4.6 billion years old, if we were going to make an estimate, but that from us to, to Adam, to the creation of Adam, I should say specifically is 6,000 years. So I actually, I believe in both concurrently at the same time, or so I should mm -hmm. say simultaneously, not concurrently. So you believe the earth is 4.6 billion years old, but you believe that yes. humans essentially are 6,000 years old. Yeah, because, well, look, it's- For humans, Bible at least in the form that we are today. Yeah. yeah. The, the Bible is silent on a lot of different things for specific reasons. It's just not important for, for, it, for the story. Okay, so when the Lord revealed himself in the scriptures, which I believe because, the, you know, Paul says it in the New Testament, and, and we should start by saying, what are we talking about when we're talking about the New Testament? Um, uh, mm -hmm. The authors of the New Testament, almost all of them, were Jewish. Okay, the whole mm -hmm. Bible is pretty much written by uh, by most of the authors of the of the. And when I say the authors of the Bible, is because there were different authors for different books of the Bible, right? So, mm -hmm. so they were all they were most of them were Jewish. Okay, so Paul, the Apostle Paul, who was known as Rab Sha or Rabbi Shaul, if you would, he was a Jewish rabbi, and he was a member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, when he was young, which meant he was really the pinnacle of Judaism, right? He would have been a, considered by our standards an Orthodox Jew right. um, or an ultra-Orthodox Jew. Right. Uh, he also becomes one of the spearheads for uh, Christianity, right? He's the, uh, some people call Pauline Christianity um, because he spread it to the Gentiles who were, a Gentile is a non-Jew. Essentially, mm -hmm. everybody who's not Jewish is considered a Gentile by, by mm -hmm. Jews living in the first century. So, you know, uh, when, uh, when, when, you know, the, the Bible's written by all of these men and uh, they have a distinct full, uh, you know, perspective and, and, uh, of, 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 of the world. Now, so this, the, the Bible doesn't really say that the earth is 6,000 years old. It, it, when you go back and you start counting the generations, it goes up, it counts up to about 6,000 years back to Adam. But it's pretty, it's pretty silent on, on different things because, um, and this is what, you know, I was talking about the Bible is God breathed, and so it's all inspiration. But it's the book is inspiration or is inspired by by God. So it's talking about what it's talking about salvation. It's not really just. It's not a history book per se. It's mm -hmm. not a book that's meant to discuss everything that about existence. Because as one of the other disciples said, you know, if you were to record everything Jesus did. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to fit it all in any book. I mean, it was it just goes on and on and on. He did so many different things. We know that you know Christ had this life, for instance, when he was when it, beyond what's recorded in the Gospels. It's just not all there. So it's not it's not important for the general message, which is the salvation of man. Uh, so that's why people wonder why it's like it's not supposed to read like that. It's just giving you kind of general rules here and there, and sometimes it becomes very specific, and sometimes it doesn't. So when you, when when you start getting drilling into what it's where it's written, let's take one of the most important things it's it's in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth right and that's mm -hmm. genesis 1 1 but mm -hmm. in genesis 1 1 the word there that means um the word there that actually means 
uh, uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then verse two actually goes, and the earth became without, and the earth was without form and void and darkness covered uh, the earth. Now, the word there where it says, uh, and the earth was without form and void and darkness covered the, without form and void is actually uh, a Hebrew word. It's, and, I, and I'm going to try to pronounce this correctly. It's toho wavuhu or toho wabuhu, depending on who's pronunciation you prefer and it's actually it actually uh it's a it's a sign of it's just translated in english as without form and void but it's it's indicative of divine judgment it's used two other places in scripture it's used in isaiah 34 11 and and in jeremiah 4 23 and it's talking about divine judgment in those two places so it's it's other two uses in the in the scripture refer to cataclysmic event a destruction of some sort um, so, uh, the, the word, the word without form and void actually defines that. Now the Hebrew word for, um, for was is it's actually Haya. Okay. And that actually is a verb that can be translated as to come out of, become, became, uh, to fall out. It's translated in all different ways. The only place in the scripture where it's a present tense verse is in Genesis 1, 2. Uh, everywhere else, it's always a past tense verse, a verb, a, pre- a present tense verb. It's actually, a, in this case, it's a past tense verb if you really def- if you really translate it correctly. So it should be what it became without form and void. And so that's where, uh, that's where the, uh, when we start looking at Genesis 1, 2, it's actually, you're, you're staring at it, and it's like, you, you just trans, if you just translate was as became, kind of changes the whole meaning. So it's saying there, well, uh, the earth became without form and void or toho wavuhu, which means divine judgment. The earth was cursed. So then you're sitting there going, well, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was cursed or became cursed. Well, then what happened that caused the earth to become cursed? So that's where gap theory comes in. And, and, and gap theory creationism is, is something that's been around for centuries. I think Thomas Aquinas sp- wrote about it, actually inferred it uh, in some of his writings. He actually, if I remember correctly, said something along the lines of um, the creation event of Genesis 1-1 should be differentiated from the creation of Adam, which is exactly what I do. I, I look at Adam's creation was another creation. There have been creations in time. Once you do that, and there's really no arguing this, then you start talking about, well, sometime uh, there was in time immemorial, God created the heavens and the earth way back. Call that the Big Bang if you want, right? That act mm-hmm. of faith that I, that, that, you know, you can, I was talking about earlier where right. scientists can trace themselves all the way back to that event, but they can't actually tell you how it happened. How did something come out of nothing? Well, we'll just say that was the God created event. Um, but then there was other creations in between that, 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 that the Lord had done some other acts on earth. At different mm-hmm. times and it's the bible's just kind of mentions it passively or alludes to it at times but doesn't actually explicitly get into it because it's not really important because it's not talking about man it's not talking about our civilization mm-hmm. the bible refers to it really the civilization of 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 man you know so it, it and the race of man it doesn't talk about races so it just talks about human civilization generally and um you know, and that's what that's where it comes from. So that's that's actually the my my I've always had that since I was a, a very young and um oh. that that perspective on on the scripture and uh, and there are other scriptures uh, that did you want to ask me any questions? I don't want to keep no no on, I'm on. yeah no. keep, keep <laughs> I I'll let you finish this yeah okay so you know um, another thing too it's like if you and uh, if you go up to like Isaiah forty five eighteen. Mm-hmm. In, in 45, 18, and I'll just, I have it in front of me right now, so I'll just read it. Okay. Uh, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, uh, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he may, He hath established it, he created it not in vain. Uh, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. Now that's interesting because he says there in the, the in the English, and I'm reading the King James, he says, he created it not in vain. That's the word, the word vain there is again in Hebrew, tohu. It's not tohu wavuhu, but it's tohu again. Now it's he's saying right there, this is a contradiction in the scripture. He's saying right there, he didn't create it accursed or void. Okay. Uh, now yeah, in the beginning, but it's re- it's referencing the creative act of God going back to Genesis one one, and the, you know I'm for I'm the God that created the heavens, God Himself that formed the earth. Right? I did right. not create this in vain. 
who he's saying. But in the if you go to Genesis one one and one two, if you read them concurrently, it mm-hmm. does read that way. It reads as if, well, okay, he created the earth and he created it formless and void. He created it at a curse, which makes no sense because he's saying here he doesn't. And it makes sense when you think about the nature of God. He doesn't create things except he creates things perfectly. Even in the creation account, when you go on further and you read Genesis 1 and you read Genesis 2, you go through the chapters. When he creates everything, he's always creating it perfect. He's always creating it beautiful. He's always creating, and it's man that sins and then everything gets accursed. And and this is universally accepted. Most people believe that. When God creates something, he does it perfect and only man destroys things that God creates. God does God creates things beautiful. So you, you start thinking this through and it starts going, yeah, it doesn't really, it makes sense what he says in Isaiah 45, 18, the prophet who's speaking as the, uh, at the unction of the Lord is in the, sort of the Lord speaking through him is saying, yeah, I create everything perfect. And, uh, and then it's like, but wait a minute, but you said that you, to Moses who um, wrote the book of Genesis, I always believe Moses mm. wrote the book of Genesis. Um, you know, um, I don't accept scholars who disagree with that though. But anyways, it's a small little footnote. But yeah, I told Moses that, hey, he created it a curse. Well, he, it doesn't really say that in Hebrew. It doesn't really read that way. If you're really breaking these up and you're paying attention, he's not really mm-hmm. saying that. He, it could have been a period of time, that, which would explain a lot. Uh, 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 in the scripture. So what um, would you say? I, I just want to clarify. What, what is yeah, it that yeah. you would say that it does say then? Yeah. Okay, so let me read. I'll read it. I'll read the, um, the verse right. to you. Yeah, yeah and then tell up. me your interpretation of that. Yeah. Yeah, I'll go one. And uh, so, so anyways, uh, let me pull this up. I'll try to get it. Um, okay, so it's this is what it says in the King James English. So in the beginning, God created mm-hmm. the heaven the heavens and the earth. Okay. I always say the heavens, but it's the heaven and the earth. Mm -hmm. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the the face of the waters. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take the original Hebrew there and we'll take that second verse and the earth was without form and void and the earth toho wavuhu, the earth uh, haya toho wavuhu. Now that's interesting because the, the verb there for was again, haya is became or to become, or it had a fall, it fell out, or it's a past tense verb is my point. It's translated in many different ways past as a past tense verb throughout the Old Testament, except in this verse where it's a present tense verb, okay? okay. Um, in the, the second, and it says, and it says here, toho wavuhu. Toho wavuhu just simply means it's tr- it's always translated it's three times it's translated in scripture is usually void or darkness okay and it's just it, it always in the in in jeremiah 423 and isaiah 34 18 uh, 34 11 it's usually tra- it's translated or it's part of a verse that has to do with divine judgment i think in the case of isaiah 34 it's about the lord's destruction of edom so Ed- edom i should say so um it has to do with some act of god judging the earth divinely now why would god create something perfect and then judge it for what it doesn't make any sense something had to have occurred something occurred between genesis 1 1 and genesis 1 2 so then you ask me okay now what happened right what's what's going on because apparently now you think about this now coming from let's let's shift to the scientific side okay we know about the ice ages Mm -hmm. okay they existed ice ages occurred now all Ice is, is what? It's frozen water. Right. That's all it is. Or frozen air. Okay, but you know, but yeah. same thing. It's, it's it's basically it's 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 fro- let's just call it what it is. It's frozen water, right? right? Okay. So the ice ages, there were there were several of them. Okay, I think the last ice age ended about twelve thousand years ago, right? Mm-hmm. And then we're in the Holocene epoch, and this is where we're at right now. It's a gradual global global warming has been going on for twelve thousand years. It is nothing new, and yeah. there are it's it's been. Been going on hey, if we take the original theory, it's been going on for as long as humans have existed, like from the beginning. Right. Yeah, right. It has been going, and and it, and are there periods of cooling, and there are periods of warming, and it's that Absolutely. planetary trends are very natural. They're very natural. They have really nothing to do with man, um, and you know, it's it's something you can't really do anything about it. And when the, when it's time for another ice age, it's going to happen again. Wait. You you can't create a policy to control the temperature of the planet. Uh, it doesn't. I don't. You know. You can't really <laughs> I'm do sorry. That. I'm, I'm, I mean, you know. I love the scene in Back to the Future too, 
where when they get to the future 2015, right? The the future as far as they knew in 1990 when they did the movie or whatever was 89. Um, right. I like when they when when it was raining out and then Doc's looking at his watch. Let's give it a couple of more minutes. And he goes right on time. You got to love the weather. They really know how to dip. they get the weather right all the time. The rain stopped at a certain time. Unfortunately, no, we 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 can't control climate like that. Um, but anyway, um, so when you're thinking about, you know, as far as uh, as far as the the earth goes and, and the water. OK, so mm. the Ice Age. All right. So look, there was an ice age. Well, the scripture's saying that there was water covering the earth, right? So, I mean, there was no word for ice at this. I mean, I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. I, I'm, you know, I mean, I could be wrong. I don't know if there's an ancient Hebrew word for ice, but I, apparently it's just water, all it is. So that's right. how I start to, that's how I start to look at it. So I'm like, yeah, I can accept the fact that there was an ice age and, 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 and up until uh, scientists are telling me 12,000 years ago, uh, things started warming up. Uh, okay, I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. The scripture says here, and this this is verse two again, and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Okay, now that's just in of itself, that's interesting, because the earth's covered with water, and the spirit of God's moving it, but water is here. So to a Christian, I would say, who believes in young earth, I would say, water was already here. I mean, God didn't create. God didn't create water. I mean, did He just? Was it just part? I mean, water is the the essence of life, right? I mean, we, yes. you know, so it's it's humans it's, are it's, something it's, like seventy five percent water, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm just like, you would think that that would get its own mention in in mm -hmm. the creative account that follows, right? But instead, it's here, and it's all over the whole earth, as if it's been destroyed again. It keeps coming back to destruction. So I keep thinking there has to be knowing that God is the great judge of the universe. Right. And, you know, and he dances beyond logic and he, and he dances beyond philosophy. You know, he, he's just, that's why it's uh, us trying to understand God's like an ant trying to understand the internet. It's just, we have finite minds and you're trying to understand the infinite, but I keep thinking, okay, he revealed himself in the scripture like this. And he's and there's these indicators. We can understand this science is a byproduct of God's creation. We can understand his creation through science. That's the beauty of science. That's why I don't, I hate this great divorce that took place yeah. over the last hundred years between science and because a lot of you know a lot of the great scientists of the past were themselves believers too they of were course. christians you know yeah, there wasn't, absolutely. They didn't see these great thinkers that none of the people living today really will be as famous as some of the men and women that lived over the last millennia or two millennia if you would sure. but these 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 great thinkers they they were able and they wrestled over these concepts but you know i'm looking at it and and like i said some of them knew about the, the, this it probably wasn't a contradiction and so i think okay there was water and water and ice okay covered the earth okay yeah maybe that one explains the other that's just and and the spirit of god's hovering over something that already existed now we know ice ages we talk about asteroids mm -hmm. you know which are mentioned a lot in scripture right there's a lot really? of mentions throughout the script well yeah asteroids are mentioned in scripture all that's mentioned in the book of revelation i think weren't well which uh, it'll tell you one this one here gets me but i don't go too far into this thinking but it is interesting okay. um there's the mention of wormwood in the book of Re revelation which was written by john the uh, the apostle okay. and uh he was the last of the disciples uh the original 12 disciples to to uh to die and he okay. died of uh, old age. i think he died of old age or he was around and it was around 90 95 ad and um he uses the word um, wormwood uh it's just referencing eschatology which is the which is the study of end time prophecy but he but he he mentions the word wormwood and, and as coming down which is like a it sounds like if you read the description it sounds like a big asteroid hitting the earth something coming down uh the way you say wormwood in uh russian is chernobyl i think I, if it's russian or ukrainian i my bad ukrainian it's chernobyl that's the way you actually translate it's kind of an interesting little kind of like freaks yeah. me out right, when i heard that now i mean you know, I'm not an expert on on the Russian. I'm sorry, the uh, Ukrainian language, but uh, mm -hmm. that's that's kind of interesting to me. Yeah, that, uh, very that the, the meaning. So, but anyway, um, so moving along, the uh, uh, the fact is that you, you have these. You have like, okay, I'm thinking water, and I, and thinking this is destruction. There's been there's been destructions here on the planet. So something must have taken place. Well, the scripture is pretty clear about what took place. That it's pretty straight. Doesn't you just people don't know when it took place. They figure it took place in the spiritual world. Took place in heaven. But there was this time when when Satan was cast out of 
heaven with a third of his with a third of the angels of heaven because he led this big rebellion against God. Now that's this is another reason that I, I subscribe to gap theory and the belief that Genesis one one and one two are 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 separated by some indeterminate amount of time, because according to the to the standard creation account of Adam, uh, by the time Adam's created. Uh, he's put in the Garden of Eden, and the serpent is there. He's the serpent's already there. So that's the serpent is identified as Satan, right? The, Satan entered the serpent, and and then tempted both Adam and Eve to sin, and that's how man fell. And, and, and that was original sin. Um, that every Christian, you know, and every Jew for that matter, that mm -hmm. accepts this, believes in the Scripture, just you know, they just accept that as basic. That's basic, fundamental. The thing is that that I, crosses my mind is then when the account of Satan's fall, it's written in, it's referenced in John, it's referenced in, I think, Revelation. It's um, also mentioned in, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's Isaiah. And um, it's, 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 I think it's Isaiah 14. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to myself, okay, so when did this occur? Mm -hmm. Because according to the, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm going to myself, it had to have occurred before, and not, I'm not, not within a few days, right? I mean, create the, the Lord creates earth, the earth in six days, a Adam's in the garden, and all of a sudden they're sinning. So it happened really rapidly. Okay, so when did when did Satan actually lead this rebellion? Um, he couldn't have really let, he had to lead it before he was a serpent, before he was in, in the serpent, and the serpent was tempting Eve and then Adam. It had to have happened before that, but I mean, um, much before that, I mean, you know, it had to have happened long before that, but they didn't have much time if the earth is only at this point, six or seven days old, seven mm -hmm. days old, that's about it. So, so if you read, um, actually, it's kind of interesting. It's in, I, it's Ezekiel 28, 13, and I have it up on my screen right now, and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll read this. And this is actually throws a lot of people, and Ezekiel, of course, being another prophet, uh, and I don't know how many of the people listening are familiar, Jeremiah is a prophet, Ezekiel is a prophet, Isaiah is a prophet, these are all Jewish prophets, Hebrew prophets from the Old Testament, both Christians and Jews accept these as, as prophets of the Lord. And so the, uh, the uh, book of Ezekiel, uh, chapter 28, verse 13, and I'll go back uh, briefly, I'll just reference verse 12 kind of sets this uh, up, because... Uh, it's the prophet Ezekiel speaking to the king of Tyre or Tyree, if you wanted to, it depends on how you want to again pronounce it, uh, mm -hmm. and which which was in Lebanon. Basically, he's a king in Lebanon, uh, modern day Lebanon. It was the ancient uh, Phoenicia. It was the ancient uh, uh, that's the where the cedars of Lebanon came from that they used to build the Solomon's Temple, but um, it's where it is today, Lebanon. And uh, so the, the Lord's prophesying, and all of a sudden in verse 13, it doesn't seem he's talking to the king anymore. He's talking to the prophet. The prophet's, you know, charging the king of Tyre. He's saying, you, you're, this, you're this now. All of a sudden he goes off and he, it seems like he just diverts and he goes into a different direction. And he goes, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. And, I, and I'm, the topaz, the diamonds, the onyx, he goes on and on and on. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> this king of Phoenicia wasn't in the garden of God. So he's obviously, uh, he's speaking about the spirit behind the throne, if you would. Uh, he's now prophesying about, uh, which just happens a lot in scripture and throws a lot of people off. When you're reading prophets, there was a great book. I forgot the name of the, the Orthodox rabbi that wrote it. It's called The Prophets, if you can find it. It's really yeah. interesting because it talks about how to approach the prophets when you read them because they do this they speaking on different levels you know they're right. the hebrews believe in at least four levels of interpretation to every scripture so so you know you got this you got the literal and then you have the deeper meaning and then you have the right. spiritual and there's different levels to every verse in the bible so it throws people off when when you're reading this but um to go on he says thou art the anointed cherub that covereth and i have set thee so thou wast upon the holy mountain of god Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stone. Uh, I have to go verse by verse, so excuse me on this because I'm, I'm skipping yeah. through the pages. All thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day thou wast created. So angels are created to, by God too, of course. Till iniquity or sin was found in thee. Okay, uh, and uh, and then and then he says here um, by the multitude of thy merchandise or activities they have filled the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. 
Now, um, in other, uh, and then he goes on to say, uh, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Uh, uh, thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. This had already happened. This is, first of all, he's referencing, uh, clearly referencing Lucifer or Satan, Hasatan, as you would say in Hebrew or, or Arabic. And it's clearly a reference to him, the anointed cherub that committed a major sin. I'm going to cast you out. But he's speaking almost like uh, future, prof or I should say past prophetic in a sense that he's like looking at the, he's, look, he's talking about like he's going to do it, but it's already had happened because he was already, uh, by the time this Ezekiel's even prophesying to the king of Tyre, he's actually, Satan's already amongst us, right? He's already been in the garden, man's already sinned. Uh, you're dealing with the nations of the earth the way pretty much the ancient world is as we accept it today and know it today. So, you know, what, what you have here is you have a reference to something that happened in, in time immemorial, something that happened in the past, and the prophet's referencing it like he's witnessing it, but it's already happened in some time in the past, and it's a reference to Satan. But the thing that strikes me here is that he references him being in Eden, and yet in chapter 2, I think it's verse 11, 12, or 13 of the book of Genesis, it mm -hmm. says, and the Lord planted a garden in the, uh, in the east of Eden. Well, that usually people just go the Garden of Eden, mm -hmm. right? But Eden was already here. It's even saying it there in Genesis 2. It's saying man hadn't toiled the land yet. So the Lord pretty much had just, you know, and there would be no raining on the earth. So the Lord was just, he had created this beautiful, perfect environment where you didn't even need rain. Everything was just growing, you know, it was just there. And he created, and he decided, I'm going to make this little garden and I'm going to put man in it to keep it, right? Mm -hmm. That's what he actually says, to keep it. Keep it to tend it, to protect it. Protect it from what? Okay, because Satan was already here. Do you think just people just read over these things? They don't get, and guess what? Eden was already here. So the area, at least, that was designated Eden, because if you go back to Ezekiel, like I was reading chapter 28, um, uh, Satan was, was a prince in, in, in Eden. But wait a minute, when you're reading the account in Genesis, he's a serpent in the garden. So obviously, these things are happening at different times. But the fact that the, the creation event happens at the beginning, quote unquote, of creation, right, or within within seven days, it had to have happened sometime before that, and there is no time before that unless you accept the fact that the Earth is much older than six thousand years. So for me, it's like I can't even I can't accept a six thousand year as a Christian, as the kind you know the as as who I am. And by the way, this is not universally accepted even amongst Pentecostals. I'm I would be considered extremely controversial. It's just. I cannot accept that unless I accept the fact that the earth is much older. Science for me has actually helped me understand more of the Bible. I don't even see it as a contradiction That's awesome. anymore. Yeah, I don't even see it as a contradiction anymore. It, to, me, it's, it, 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 to me, it makes God look that much bigger. It, it really does. When you try to confine, see, then you get these idiots on the far left that make up jokes, and they'll do this anyway. Oh, you believe that Adam rode dinosaurs and all this? No, no, not, absolutely not. I think to me, it just tells me God is that. Do much people bigger. say this? <laughs> I've heard people say this before. Oh yeah, God. not to me. They don't say it to me. Most people are surprised to find out I'm a born again believer when, when, when they, because they'll know me from, from the academia and right. I'll be going on and on. And I'm talk. I never talk about, well, I do at times, you know, depending on the age of my students, but I mean, and, and the, the school I may be at or, or the university, but I, I don't, uh, you know, I don't, uh, you know, I really don't get too much into it, but this is just the way I look at it. It's just the exactly. way I look at it. And, you know, so I'll, I'll stop right there for now and let you ask me any questions or whatnot. That's like the basics there. I just gave it to you. So, yeah, well, I just got quite the education. Um, so I really appreciate that. I'm yeah. really curious about kind of, I know there's been like a lot of people say there's a lot of parallels to the four horsemen and, you know, you had mentioned end times and, I'm curious your thoughts on that, like where we are today and what the Bible well, says about it. So, yeah, so I definitely have uh, mm -hmm. definitive views of, of end times. And I know a lot of people that follow me are, are born again believers and definitely get into Israel and end times and everything. And I am a, I am a Christian Zionist, I guess you would say. Mm -hmm. I think um, for me, I think that the, the fact is that, you know, um, if we're, I look at things in, in different, I, I kind of box things. So if we're talking about, um, if we're talking about the natural, okay, I'll have to put it to you like this. If we're talking about how things should naturally work out, 
Right. Um, that's where I become a declinist. And I say, well, we're on decline and fall. Western civilization is eventually going to end. I, I was going to say the whole declinist. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. So I say that's just that um, if we're talking and, and if I always say, and when I'm talking to believers, I'll say, if the Lord tarries, this is how I believe. Terry, meaning if the Lord takes his time returning, because I believe in the imminent return of the, of the Lord, Jesus Christ, I believe he'll, he's going to come in a second coming. Um, I believe that's literal. And, and, and just so everybody knows, this is going to be controversial for some people out there. Guess what? <laughs> Newsflash, Jesus was a Jew. I just want to put that out there. I love telling people, I usually tell my kids, my students that and they crack up laugh. I say, it's overlooked a little bit, but he was Hebrew. I get into this on Twitter sometimes with people. And, uh, I, in I'm fact, by our that, team, I'm surprised that's what? controversial that Jesus was a Jew. Oh, it's, it's, you know, if I'm being totally honest, um, I, I've said that to people and I found people on the, extremely rare, it's not, com it's not very common, uh -huh. but I will find people on the far right, uh, and I'll use the word far right there, quote unquote, that yeah. have a less than appreciative view of the, uh, the Jewish origins of, of the scripture. And uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's to their, it's to their detriment. It's sad. If somebody out there is listening to me now, listening to this, I would say open up yourself a little bit because it makes everything a lot bigger and richer. If you start accepting the Hebraic roots of the scripture, the, the Jewish roots, if you would, of, of the scripture, mm -hmm. it's not, it doesn't, doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't cost <laughs> so It does. It's, it's actually fun. Um, yeah. But, you mean uh, learning's fun? Crazy. Yeah, it's learning yeah. can be fun. That's right. <laughs> learning can be fun. So, so G, I mean, you know, and we and, and just a Jesus was a rabbi, and in so when I said it to some people out there, I think I don't know if it, who it was. Somebody responded and said, "No, he wasn't." I said, "Well, okay. Here's here's how I define that. Here's how I define that. Okay, I come to I actually not define it. I can how I can come to that conclusion. He's mm -hmm. called Rabbi Rabone, uh two or three times in the New Testament, and mm -hmm. he taught at the temple." Now he was just widely accepted by the San. Again, the Sanhedrin would have to give their, which uh, people that may not know that the Sanhedrin at this time was like the epitome. They were like the top, if you would quote unquote, priests of Israel. They uh, they were the they typically made up of scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees, and they controlled the temple. The temple being Herod's temple, which was the rebuilt. Solomon's temple, okay, which is uh, with the Temple Mount in Israel today. That's in Jerusalem. That's where the temple stood. But okay. that that Jesus was invited there or was allowed to speak there at the temple and teach thousands of people, myriads of people, as Paul, as as Luke puts it in the Book of Acts, um, when referencing how how many people actually subscribe to early, to first century Christianity in in Israel. Uh, which we would call Christianity, quote unquote. You actually better put it Messianic Judaism is would be a better way of putting it. Um, the thing is that when you look at that, uh, you actually get this impression. How did if Jesus was this radical anti, you know, uh, Orthodox Jew or anti-Jew kind of uh, person? How was he even there? Why would he be called rabbi by by people? Why would he would which means teacher? It simply means teacher. Why would he be allowed to speak at temple? Why would he be allowed in synagogues to speak? This was 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 common, and so you know he was widely acceptable, and 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 they he was a messi a messianic figure to many Jews who ended up not you know subscribing to his 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 interpretation of the scripture and following him and getting saved. I mean, it was just he was just widely respected. I mean, there were there were even Pharisees that came up to him and and uh, like Joseph of Arimathea, who actually, you know, he ended up getting buried in 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 a crypt that was owned by him. So, you know, it was um so this was so Jesus was a very, very Jewish person and and uh he actually, if you study his teachings, they leaned kind of he leaned towards the Pharisees specifically um the uh because the sadducees didn't really believe um in everything they didn't accept the whole they didn't accept the prophets uh they just accepted the torah which is the first five books of pentateuch and uh they didn't really accept anything after moses for that matter for the most part um and the pharisees were the bigger schools uh there were two well there were about four but the two big schools uh was the uh the the, the yeshiva of hillel uh which was the one that paul was from and then, of course, the yeshiva of Shammai, uh, which was a little more of a radical one. And uh, that, uh, but if you if you read Jesus's, uh, you know, in the Gospels, he's and you know what each school believed, you find that he actually kind of chided uh, the or or rebuked uh, Shammai more often than he did a Hillel school. And Hillel were a little, they were less radical from from the school of Shammai is where you get 
um, the Zionists, and from the Zionists, you get the, the radical, uh, fanatical, if you would, the IRA, quote unquote, wing <laughs> of, the, uh, of the Zionist movement. Uh, which were the um, which were the uh, the assassins, and the way you say uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the one of the things I often um, point out to people is that they were they were the zealots is what I'm referring to. They were zealots, mm -hmm. and within the zealot movement, that's the Zionist movement. You end up having actually the assassin wing, which were the ones that actually carried out um, you know attacks on Romans and. Pretty much anybody who who supported Roman occupation of Israel, because a lot of people don't know the history of this time. Rome was occupying Israel in the first century and mm -hmm. and continued to do for centuries uh, until they finally uh, were pushed out by the by the Islamics. Uh, the Eastern Empire eventually took up the burden of uh, Eastern Roman Empire actually took up the burden the Byzantines as we call them in history mm -hmm. uh, after the fall of the West. But you know the uh, the assassin wing was actually the uh, the Sakari and the Sakari, uh, the way you say that in Greek is is, uh, is um, Iscariot. And so Judas's last name, Iscariot, he was a, himself a Judean, but he was probably a member of the uh, of the zealot wing. Uh, and, and they were the assassin wing, uh, the, specifically the assassin wing of the zealots. Um, so, you know, you, one thing leads to another. And it's actually a reference to the daggers that they carried. Of the Sakari. So um, these are just little tidbits that I picked up along the way in my studies, but you know, it's uh, makes the scripture a lot more interesting to read, I think. So yeah. you know, <laughs> these fascinating. Little things. But, but anyways, so, mm -hmm. go ahead. Go ahead. No, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say back to the, you know, Declanus and uh, end time yeah, so and for horsemen. Yeah. So when you, when you get to the, I'll circle back, right? I'll circle um, back. Right? So anyway, <laughs> <Let's go back. laughs> circle back, right? Yeah. Um, the, uh, you know, if I'm, if when I'm talking to, you know, uh, if the Lord tarries, yeah, things will just decline and it'll just be the cycle cycle just keeps repeating itself. Eventually the United States will just spiral off or what have you. Um, I don't believe the Lord's going to tarry. I believe we're leaving, li living in the end times. Um, the Lord could come back this decade. Um, we're, you know, I mean, it's hard. It, I don't believe in putting a date and a time, but I do believe that it's important to point out that the things that are usually, again, generally accepted amongst many uh, scholars of, of, uh, of the study end time prophecy. A lot of the well-known ones over the last two to three to four decades have, have talked about this a uh, lot more than I have. And uh, I think that Israel being back in the land is chief. I think uh, that's a key uh, thing. That was a part that had to fall into line. They control the Jews are back. They have a state in Israel. They control Jerusalem, which I think is more significant. Um, they pretty much are, have a domination of Jerusalem, which is, I think, even more important. These are all things that had to kind of fall in line. And I think that when you look at the end times, or when you look what the world today, which I consider end times, you look at the fact that we are in moral decay, uh, that the church uh, as a whole kind of is in, apost in an apostate state. Uh, or is in, in an error, usually universally, a lot of, it, it depends on your point of view, but everybody kind of feels that, you know what, there aren't these great revivals anymore. There doesn't seem to be a great movement of God. There doesn't seem to be uh, great evangelists anymore. They, they're flashing the pans. They're really, what's going on here? You know, you, whether you were, you go back uh, from the time of the Reformation forward until I would say the, the mid 1900s, and you could find great, you know, whether it was John Wesley, John Wycliffe, uh, you come all the way down to um, Billy Sunday, um, you know, you come all the way down, you, just, you could always find people that were out there that were really, there were great movements of God. And then and, and into the Pentecostal revival, like I said earlier, which was huge. I mean, you know, uh, tens of millions of people got affected mm -hmm. from it. Uh, but you don't get that anymore. It seems like everything's kind of cool off. And it talks about this in the scripture that these were going to be, whether you're reading Jesus's words, whether you're reading Peter or Paul, it doesn't matter. They talk about what it would be like. And if you just take all of their, their verses and the scriptures, in the scripture, um, you know, you kind of get this idea that society is going to be pretty immoral. There's going to, it talks about uh, murder would increase. Uh, Jesus himself refers to uh, there'll be wars and rumors of wars. The, the Greek word that's used there is ethos or ethnos, and it means ethnicity will rise against ethnicity. So it's not really nation against nation. It's talking about ethnic group against ethnic group. Well, oh. look around us, you know, and so, you know, we've got all these things oh. going on. Um, and, uh, and then the end would come 
and it's the end of the age, uh, the end of this age that started really with his first coming, and it would be bookended by his second coming. And then uh, with that, oh, at the end end, I should say at the very last few years, um, or depending on your point of view, maybe the first few years of the of the millennial age, because most most people believe in the and when the Lord returns, there will be a, a a literal thousand year reign of Christ on Earth. Mm-hmm. The first seven years, that's how I view it. The first seven years of that is really a time of tribulation. Um, and I have my own distinct full of ways of interpreting uh, those verses, which makes sense, more sense to me when you do. But, um, you know, there there really isn't anything. I mean, if you're looking around us, there's just, man, you know, man is just indulging all his senses and there's buying and selling and there's the height of nationalism. There's all of these nations. It, it infers that there would be a lot of nations. The uh, it says in, uh, Jesus says, when you see the fig tree, uh, when you see the fig tree blo- um, uh, blossom, and you see all the trees, and it says in the book of Luke, um, that's a, the fig tree is always a reference to Israel. Well, Israel's back in the land; they're there. And then you see all of the trees, and there's this height of of of, of many different nations and stuff. And and then you all these wars are going on, and there are many different earthquakes, and there are plagues and pestilences and all this, and this is, you know, I mean, yeah, okay, yeah, that's the kind of the time we're living in, you know, and, uh, but the big thing, the key uh, to, dif- to re- differentiate this time from other periods in history where there have been plagues and pestilences and wars and stuff mm-hmm. is really the fact that there's a state of Israel, again, the way there was in the first coming, and they have control of Jerusalem, and uh, heck, you can, I mean, the Temple Faithful uh, and the Temple Institute They've even got the golden menorah ready to put up. They've they've got all the the they've training priests. They're ready to rebuild the temple, which is another thing that would probably it's referenced at the uh, the coming of the man of sin, right? The son of perdition, the antichrist, would actually reign uh, from um, from uh, he would actually reign from the temple. He would set himself up. That's the the antichrist being the false messiah. Um, it is what most Christians believe there'll be a false messiah. So, yeah, I mean, they, I just set it out there for you. So, my, so I believe it could happen. In, I mean, sure, Jesus could, the, the horn could blow and the rapture, as they call it, the, the, in, in Catholicism, they call it the rapture. It's a Latin term. It uh, just means the catching away, really, or uh, the violent taking away, if you would, of the, of the church. That could happen at any time. There's really nothing just, you know, it's just there, you know, it's just, we're, we're at that point. So, but I mean, you know, that it, it could happen now, it could happen 40, 50 years from now, who knows, you know, I just think we're really close because of the events going on in the Middle East. That's where the last major uh, battles will take place or take, take place over will be the middle, will be over Israel largely. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and, and that area, that region, which is a strategic, you know, it's a strategic point because everything has to kind of pass through that area, but it's, um, uh, I think that's where that you know, of course, Israel will have its major conflict with pretty much the the world, the whatever's left of the world. So, you know, at that time, you know, it, it's going to be. A, I mean, if you think of 9/11, you know, we woke up and 3,000 Americans were dead, and it changed the world forever. Can you imagine if suddenly millions of saints and Christians are suddenly missing around the world? I mean, the the type of that's what Christians believe is going to happen. It's called the rapture. They're just going to be caught up. Been home, the Left Behind series is a good series about this. It kind of, they, mm-hmm. they dramatize it, you know, so. But that's where I believe we're at anyways. And they're going to talk about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. All of that specifically, that's the, during the tribulation period when um, Israel's fighting for its existence again, and the Antichrist is is literally been the false messiah. He makes it to Jerusalem. He declares himself God. And it, uh, uh, Paul says this is what he does, and I think it's in uh, memory serves. It's like Second Thessalonians three. He declares himself to be God, and uh, and uh, Jesus refers to him as the abomination of desolation, standing in the holy place. The holy place was in the temple. Um, you know, that's the uh, uh, that's the, when when that's going on. This is when the earth is being pelted with wormwood, with asteroids, and all this stuff is going. There's all these terrible. Uh, times on pl- plagues like there's never been on the planet before and stuff and that's when you see the four horsemen of the apocalypse that whole thing from revelation play out it's just it's symbolic of these different disasters that are happening uh, upon the earth you know that's what that is and that all takes place it's supposed to take place uh, there's different interpretations some generally the two big the two big uh, wings is some believe that the church has to go through all of that and then some believe that they that the church is not here for that 
uh, believers in Christ. So I believe the church is not here for that. That's just my interpretation. But some people believe they have to they have to endure it. So you know it depends. But what do you, when point. you say the church is not here for that? What do you mean yeah. by that? Well, the rap. Okay, so the the, the rapture of the saints. Um, no, no, no problem. So um, according to uh, you know uh, Matthew twenty four. First Corinthians 15, I think it's verse 52, if I remember correctly, um, you know, there will be this catching away of believers. So if you, if, I don't know if you, have you ever watched the Left Behind series? I know some of the people want to watch no. it. You should watch the Left okay. Behind series. They're, they're, they're B movies. Um, Nicholas <laughs> Cage actually just remade it. He remade it as a B movie a few, about 10 years ago, I think it was. He remade them, or maybe it wasn't even 10 years, maybe it was five years ago. Um, but it's actually, his version was, actually, I watched it the other night. I didn't think, I'd never, I'd stay away from it. I didn't want to watch it. But the originals were done, with, but it wasn't that bad. Kirk Cameron did the original two or three. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's, it, it's, you know, it talks about this, this what, what Christians generally believe um, and I would say most evangelical Christians, I better qualify that, mm -hmm. is that there'll be a catching that the, the church, true believers, those that accepted Jesus Christ are walking in faith, will be taking out, taken out of this world just before uh, the just before the tribulation, which is this time of trials on the earth like it's never been before. So think of the Holocaust in World War II and uh, all kinds of plagues that have happened and multiply it by 9-11 and multiply it by a million or a hundred thousand and that's what the earth that's what the earth will be going through after the church is gone um and so that's what we we believe that's what i believe that's what i would say probably i, I would have to say probably hundreds of millions of christians have believed all through the uh uh, through the centuries, certainly for the, I would say probably at least tens of millions of Christians and in, in, in believe today living. Um, and so they, they believe that, that those that accept Jesus Christ and, and are, and are walking in the faith will be taken out, uh, just before, in fact, the, the, the rapture is the, is the, which is the Latin term actually starts the tribulation. And I can believe that because if you suddenly were to wake up tomorrow morning, Courtney, and mm -hmm. you were to turn on the news, and they're talking about millions of people missing all around the world. They would think it's either the biggest hoax, but really what it would do is, what do you think it would do to society? It would collapse the world economies and the governments of the world. I mean, people would just, and people would, families would panic, right? People would be panicking right. sure. like, 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 like nothing. You'll, COVID panic will look like kitty play, you know, 9-11 will right. look like kitty play. And sure. so that's, that's probably, um, it, it, it's an impetus, or if you're not an impetus, but a catalyst for, yeah. Um, the following thing, the following years, and it's supposed to be a seven-year tribulation. And at the end of that seven years is when Jesus actually physically uh, comes back with the church and establishes his kingdom, and he rules here uh, for his thousand-year millennium, for his millennium uh, from uh, from Jerusalem as as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's what he's promised to do. He, when he went up, he says, "I'll be coming back." You know, the angel said, I'll, "He'll be coming back the same way he went up." And that's that's actually how most Christians universally, I say most, especially especially Protestants and probably specifically evangelicals talk about this more than anyone else, which, you know, it's a lot of people. I mean, it's just that's a lot of Christians that that, that this is uh, universally accepted. Like it's just that some people believe the church has to go through it mm -hmm. and they don't get raptured. Other people accept the believe the rapture takes place before. That's how I view it, which is the more conventional way of viewing it. That's the traditional way of viewing it. Fascinating. Did I, did I did I did I put you to sleep? I hope I didn't put all. No, not at all. I, I mean, it's fascinating. This is not something that I'm really versed in at all. So it's a lot to take in. I, yeah. No, no um, problem. I'll be happy to you ask me any questions. I don't. This is this is my this is my my heart and soul right here. More than history and civics, certainly more than civics and 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 certain certainly more than civics. I'd rather talk about the things of the Lord than talk about American <laughs> civics. So just, well, I I, I think thing. that. Uh, I, I think the civics is really, I think it's very relevant. I think it helps to, I, I think that they're all intertwined because For I, sure. yeah. Um, but I understand that this is very much where your heart is and that's awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm curious what you think it just to kind of uh, wrap this up. I'm curious about your perspective on what people should do moving forward, because if if we are theoretically at end times, I think that's a really hard thing for people to wrap their head around. And I don't know that, you know, there's much 
uh, preparations for? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, it's nothing to be, af- I mean, here's the thing, right? I mean, um, you know, when you go back to the first century, the early church, they, they, when, when we say the early, the first century church, we're talking again until about 60 or 70 or 80 AD, we're talking mostly about Jews, okay, mm-hmm. Jewish believers in Jesus and Yeshua, his, his Hebrew name, Yeshua. So, you know, you have, you have these, these, you're talking about, they, they pretty much, um, how did they live, right? They, and, and, and when you read Paul, and Paul's very, you know, I always recommend to people when I get to know them, and I'll just say it often, is Paul's writings are spiritual. They're very, they're spiritually discerned. And so it's really hard to jump into, because he's very, he talk about deep thinking. Um, you know, it's, and, and, you know, it wasn't just philosophy. He's talking about the spiritual, which is a mm-hmm. big universe, right? So it's yeah. like, he's, he's, uh, he's discussing, it, he's, he's discussing eternities, in a sense, if I can use it, put the word like that, you know, he's discussing yeah. the infinite. And yeah. it's very hard. He even says it, that, you know, times that, you know, look, I'm going to show you a mystery. And he's talking about the divine nature of God. And this is where this is a contra. I'll give you a little, I'll, I'll, I will come back to what you just asked me. But it's mm-hmm. like when he talks about the nature of God, he talks about their three persons, and he uses the word Godhead. It's, tr- it's beautifully translated uh, from the Greek in- as Godhead. And it's, it's the triune. And this is where the Trinity comes from the, the, the concept of, of, of the, the Trinity, which uh, surprisingly, was the uh, council, uh, if I remember correctly, was the council of, uh, of, of uh, Con- uh, Constantinople and then Nicaea that actually, con- that actually coined, I think it was actually Constantine himself that coined the phrase uh, that they used for, for, for Trinity. Mm-hmm. Um, but people often go, because I mean, we have them, we have uh, oneness groups in the evangelical movements that, or Jesus only as they're known, that believe that there is no, you know, they just put Jesus is God and that's it. Um, I, I don't accept that. I, some, there's some Pentecostal sects that ac- actually, uh, you know, believe in Jesus only. I believe that there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So I believe in the, in the conventional sense of the Trinity. Now, um, some people say uh, that are outside of the faith, uh, Christianity, and even within the, those of the oneness, believe they say, you're, well, you're, you're subscribing to polytheism. No, I didn't say there were three gods. I said there are three personalities to God. But when Paul is addressing this, he calls it a mystery because it's going to be kind of hard to wrap your mind around it because we keep thinking, well, we're like, we have one soul and one spirit. We're, we're individual. You're an individual. I'm an individual. So when you talk about three personalities, it's hard to accept that. Um, but you can see it displayed throughout scripture, especially, well, I should say throughout the New Testament, because you see Jesus praying to the Father and, and, and just things like that. And you see the, the, the Holy Spirit come down as a dove and speak through John the Baptist uh, to Jesus. And it's like, well, what is he speaking to himself? In a sense, yes, in, in, in a way, but these are three distinct personalities. The Father didn't die on the cross. The Son died on the cross, and he's the full expression of the Father. And he, again, uh, these are spirit, meant to be spiritually discerned. You, you you can't use you can use your mind or in the, the Latin, in the Greek it's nuance as much as you want to try to understand it, but um, this is this is God's unique infinite uh, character, if you would, and so it's 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 interesting. And I believe that man is created in his image. He says that in the scripture, he's created in his image, and that means woman too. In his image, he created he them man and woman in his image and, and likeness and so specifically in his likeness. And so it's interesting because uh, I believe that we're, we're three parts to our personalities too. We are, we are spirit, soul, and body. Paul puts it like that in first Corinth, first Thessalonians, I think it's five nineteen. He goes may the Lord save you fully in spirit, soul, and body. So he, he uses three distinct words in Greek to define your spirit from your soul, from your body. So we're tripartite. So we're kind of like, we're complex beings. And we know this, you know, this yeah. from being a philosophy major, that this, there is a soul, man has a soul. And, and, and so you, and you have your mind, you have your brain. And so you have, and then you've got your body. So you've got three distinct parts right there you're talking about already. So you, it's yeah. the knowledge is already there. And so we're, well, we're made in God's, God has three, per, God has three distinct personalities, three parts to himself, if you would. And so, um, and that's, that's what we're, but, but, but anyway, now going back to um, how do we prep for this? When we were talking about the, uh, the end times, then the first century Paul's writing and Paul at times comes across like he expected Jesus to return then, like he would, that, that, that he was going to be back in, and he reads like that at times. But I think Paul in a sense is being this apostle and being anointed by the Lord, like the prophets of old. 
he's he's sort of speaking on different levels of interpretation. Yeah, he, he the Lord's going to return, but he never said that he didn't say the Lord was going to return in sixty nine eighty. You know, or the Lord's going to return in 78. He didn't say that. Right. Um, you know, he didn't put a date on it. It's just that the Lord will is going to return. We're in the last days. And and I and a lot of people go, well, what does that mean? The last days? And I'm like, there's scriptures that say the day is like a thousand years, right? So there's like, if you're talking about creation, right? Six days now, 6,000 years, right? The seventh, um, this is why a lot of people at the millennium in 2000 thought it was going to be the uh, Christian. Some people in Christian sects thought, hey, Jesus was going to return that year. You know, there was going to be a return. And, 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 and so you, but you, the point in all of this, whether you're living in the first century or whether you're living today um, in the new millennium, if you would, the 2000s or the 2020s now, the, two, the new yeah. 20s. Um, is that you, you live in expectation that he's going to return sometime soon because he, he, you don't know in that day or hour, Jesus says, you're not going to know. I'm going to be like a thief in the night. You're not going to know when I'm going to come back. And, uh, and so you live in expectation in the first century. That was the height of messianic expectation to the Jews. They were expecting that the Messiah was going to return then because they were looking at the book of Daniel. That's what we'll have to be for another show. We can do this sometime where we could talk about first century eschatology and messianic uh, and, and messianic views of the scripture. But they literally were believing that the temple was standing. Um, it had been rebuilt and they believed that the Messiah had to come when the temple was built. And so it was there and they were expecting Messiah to come. And that's why from before Christ, really, from if you go back to uh, the Maccabees for, to the uh, to the the second century, I believe that was the second century BC, all the way down to um, uh, to the Bar Kokhba re uh, revolt in in the second century AD, there were a lot of people, a lot of figures that that came up even at the time of Christ that were claiming to be the Messiah, or people thought that that was the Messiah. Jesus was just one of them. Um, his was the biggest, obviously. His his message resonated the most with so many people, especially amongst the Gentiles in the long run. But um, uh, he there were there was this height that, that Messiah was going to come, and uh, and there was a ex total expectation of this. Uh, so bookending it, go shoot ahead 2,000 years, two more days, uh, where I'm expecting the second return of the Lord, the Jews are still waiting, Orthodox Jews are still waiting for the Messiah to, uh, to come. I'm expecting the Messiah to return. And, and so I, I look, we, I just live like, you know what, I, I, I follow the scripture as best I can. I try to be the, uh, try to walk in the spirit and, and, and live up to the faith and, and the, and the creeds, if you would, of the apostles. But um, I think that's what, when you're talking to people, I say, just, live your out your life the way you would normally as a good christian you know you know what what you ask yourself what would christ do don't live in fear that the that oh i'm going you know this the end suddenly going to come upon us i believe that the lord will rescue the church if you would the rapture out before tribulation comes um i don't believe that i just to me the scripture reads that way and i think that's the predominant view amongst uh most uh, again, most uh, Protestant Christians. I don't exactly know. I've, I, you know, the, the Catholic view is kind of amillennial, so I don't really know what they, how they, how they interpret that. Um, but I would just say to everybody universally, make sure you're following after the precept, you're subscribing to the precepts of Jesus Christ. You're following after the uh, the Lord. You're living in the Spirit, and like you would normally, and just live out your life. You know, and 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 if he comes in your, and if he comes in this lifetime of ours, hey, wonderful, great, it's a good thing. Because, you know, it'll be a perfect world and we won't have to worry about corruption and government and recounts and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, we won't have to be having these, we'll be, we'll be all, you know, and it's not, I don't believe it's going to be boring either. I believe it's going to be a fully functioning, this idea of, you know, I often think people have these pers this perspective of heaven as this boring place where people are dressed in, in like togas or, or, or sheets and, walk, and flying around with wings and harps. And that's not, that's not, you know, it's probably a, the Lord created earth in the image. Uh, everything here pretty much mimics what he has up there. So um, the, the, I just think it's gonna, it's just that much bigger. The universe is very big. It's in God. And so, you know, when it's revealed and he brings it down on earth, this is going to be the capital of his government. It's going to be a fully functioning government. It may not have the technology we have, probably because technology, modern technology, if you would, 
uh, is really a product of, of, uh, of the industrial revolution. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, if you can just think of the ancient world, that's probably more or less how it's going to be functioning. And, Why wouldn't uh, it have uh, the modern technology? I, I don't think it's necessary. I know there. Are, I've actually heard Christians who believe pretty much exactly the way I do um, go on that they like, hey, they the Lord's going to use television to communicate and stuff. During the tribulation, no doubt, I think that's going to be there are events that seem to be imply that it's universally watched by people on different sides of the planet. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that uh, the uh, I don't think there's a necessity for technology. I think mm -hmm. technology, I, I mean, I'll paraphrase Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. It's the high priest of false securities. I don't really think there's a need for it in, in the Lord's King because he's he's a, he's God on earth. You know, what it would. What, use does he have for it really i'm talking about man's technology you know i'm just you know something that man what, what does he but i mean i could be wrong yeah i mean i don't know maybe i, maybe I was just curious it. what your thought yeah. process behind it was yeah yeah i mean maybe i just don't think we're going to need cell phones frankly i, I just don't think this. <laughs> i don't think this i mean you know what for you know it's it's that kind of, i mean i don't know but that's just me that's just my view on i got my own kind of like folksy kind of views on on some some little details like that but you know, it's, uh, it's like that. So, but anyways, yeah, that's, uh, that's the, um, so it's, a, it's just interesting. Uh, it's a big topic and, um, uh, yeah. you know, it's, um, you know, when you start talking about spiritual matters and, and salvation, certainly, and, you know, and I know a lot of people out there listening, they'll, they, you know, they'll be very familiar. Some of them may not be so familiar and, and with, the mm -hmm. some of the things I address, but, um, it's interesting. It's all, I know it's really fascinating. It's really fascinating. I, I have a question about, this is not yeah. directly related, but your thoughts on I that this is just my own personal kind of I, I think the United States is very unique. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, we are the only nation that does have the Judeo Christian values woven mm -hmm. into our founding documents. And so I'm curious your thoughts on, yeah, how does the United States fit into a uh religious or spiritual um like context oh boy really you're really you're really cutting into it. i'm probably going to lose half my followers either that or i'm going to gain another i'm going to double my fall i don't know one or the other so it's like so i'm going to disappoint a lot of people out there uh mm -hmm. since i was very young lad um i'll use the uh the uk expression the scottish expression mm -hmm. uh i uh have believed that the united states has no role in end time prophecy because um it's not mentioned and it's not even alluded to in scripture it's kind of unusual and a lot and i think a lot of people know that too that there's a debate raging about this like where's the u.s in his in in prophecy it's it's not there or they try to fit it in in different areas where it doesn't really make much sense. Mm -hmm. um, my my general feeling on this, and this goes back again to to my uh, childhood, my teenage years, is I really believe uh, that the United States. I hate to say this, but I, I have to be honest when I'm talking about things of the Lord. I yeah. believe the United States is Babylon, and so and, and Babylon in the Scripture. And now people are going to go. Well, some people believe, I, and I know this. Everyone has a different interpretation. Some people believe Babylon's up, literally Iraq res resurfaced, you know, coming back to power in some way. And I don't believe that's what it's referencing in, in the uh, in in the in the New Testament, specifically in the Book of Re Revelation. Mm -hmm. um, other other people believe that it's referring to a false religion. You know, it's a it's a you know mystery religion, mystery Babylon. Mm -hmm. I think actually no. I think it's it sounds like the description in Revelation. I think it's seventeen and eighteen. Kind of gives me the impression that it's referencing a very powerful political entity that mm -hmm. dominates world affairs and dictates policy. And it's kind of hated by a lot of the old world. And that sounds an awfully like an awful lot like the United States. And um, I, it would fit in a lot of ways because it seems like Babylon, according to prophecy, is destroyed quite early in the tribulation. And so I've had a subscription for many years to that theory that the U.S., when the, the way I view it is, I believe the rapture takes place, the dead in Christ, by the way, the rapture is not just the living in Christ, it's the dead in Christ too. So it's like the graves are opened up the way they were in, in Matthew 27, I think it's verses 50 to 53, when Jesus rose from the dead, the graves opened up and people don't really know this. They think of Jesus rising from the dead. When he came up, a lot of the saints came up with them and they went and walked in the streets, people that probably had just recently died. 
and and let themselves be seen and known to their families. It, it actually says that in the scripture. They walked into the into the community. So so when because when Jesus rises from the dead, or when someone, everybody kind of rises from the dead. So when when he comes back to catch the uh, the saints, he also opens up the graves and he takes up the. When all of that happens, the tribulation starts. I believe the United States is kind of knocked out uh, a, a short time after that. And that's just uh, because the book of Jeremiah, and I think it's chapters uh, 50 to 53, I could be off maybe by one chapter, talks about the destruction of Babylon in there. And then the book of Revelation 7, uh, 17 and 18, um, the destruction of Babylon happened once before in history. Uh, Babylon was destroyed. Uh, you know, uh, once great empire of Nebuchadnezzar came crumbling down, but uh, and it happened within two generations. It happened rapidly. Uh, but it also talks about it, it, this. Again, I'm going to use Toho Wavuhu. It talks of, it, but it, the expression isn't used there specifically. But it talks about this devastation of the area of which is Babylon, the city and the empire. And it was a city state. It was a, as you were saying in Greek, a polis. It was a city state and uh, became an empire in Mesopotamia. But it talks about it like it was destroyed in such a way that no, it says no Arab pitched a tent there ever again. No animal lived in the, in that region ever again. Well, that's not true. That never happened. Um, so it's again, the prophet, I believe speaking about, okay, Here's Babylon, the physical nation, the Lord's going to destroy it, and he did, but I'm going to also look beyond that to the spirit behind it and to something that comes down in the future, because history repeats itself. But one thing as a historian, you do know that. That history repeats itself. It doesn't just echo and seem familiar. It actually repeats itself. Oh, yeah. Just the, the names change maybe, but that's about it. Right. Um, you know, so it, it's just this, again, where everything is cyclical, so it's a cycle, and and so the prophet's just referring to that. He's looking down. He's looking down at the end times, and it fits with again a mystery, a mysterious Babylon, a Babylon that we don't know. We can't identify. At least to the time of of John when he was writing it, he couldn't identify it, and it and it's destroyed. It suddenly it's burned to, by fire from one end of the other. All I, okay, nuclear weapons can do that. Um, you know, it's just so I believe that because we know that heck, we know the tribulations full of wars that are terrible and they create plagues, biological chemical warfare, probably nuclear warfare is, is implied. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we have the technology today to, yeah, the U S could be knocked out uh, by a major superpower. Uh, the only thing left, you know, and things that are mentioned, China's mentioned, the Asian Kings are mentioned. Uh, the, the great Kings from the East are mentioned. They come to, they head towards Jerusalem too. Well, they're major players these days. Um, you know, I mean, pretty much all the Arab nations are mentioned over and over again. Uh, they, they're, they're mentioned in scripture and, um, and Russia's alluded to uh, so, so significantly. And so I can see, but again, for all of that to happen, what has to happen first? You can't have, you have to have a major econo socioeconomic and political collapse that, that, that is like nothing the world has ever seen and has to happen suddenly. And then on top of it, you got to mate that to some other major event. Well, what would, because the United States would still be here and it would still happen. When I say the church is rapture, it doesn't mean every good person is suddenly gone from the planet by any, by any stretch of the imagination. There are going to be a lot of people, quote unquote, left behind, hence the name of the book series, uh, that are trying to do the right thing and save humanity. And that's what the stories are, the fictional stories are about in the Left Behind series. But, um, you know, they're that that the US in the book series, the US is here. But I tend to think now, I think the United States is probably gonna, and I, and I Jen, I, I, I kind of view it, but that's again, my total personal, yeah. the very few people I've, I've, I've met that have actually, uh, I don't think, I think maybe there's like two or three people in my family that view it like that. So it's just my interpretation of that. Um, it it, it kind of it makes it easy, you know, kind of like you can just say, yeah, the United States isn't here, you know, and it's just knocked out, you know, so I don't have to, I don't have to think that far into it. So. <laughs> so you're really saying that you came to this theory out of laziness. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it, it, it kind of fit because I sit there and, you you know, you're going, you want to believe that the United States, um, you know, it, you know, is going to, is going to, and here's my thing, okay? Until Christ comes back, none of this even matters what I'm talking about. It just doesn't, it doesn't have any place in really the, in, in history as it really, as we understand it. Right. Uh, this is, I'm referring to a time that has that it's an end of an age. 
And exactly. at the end of that age, these major, major catastrophes take place. And so people, you know, this is a problem when you're talking about eschatology, people start to, I think, want to run and hide. There's like, uh, I get these, like, like War of the Worlds, the War of the Worlds scare, remember with Orson Welles, and yep. people get afraid that the aliens are invading, and they want to, and mm-hmm. they, and they don't, and, and I'm not trying to, because the wonderful thing is Jesus is coming back, and he saves, and, and, and this, you know, when he sets up his kingdom, um, we're simply not going to have, he's going to route out all corruption. I mean, that's going to be a day of judgment, like has never happened before, so. You know, it's it's going to be a good thing. Actually, we worry about we talk about where are we going to have justice? There's no judges that are just. Well, the great judge is coming. So you know, he's coming. so so don't worry about. He's going to get them all at the end. So you know, we don't have to worry about. It. That's why I'm kind of more ah, cavalier about it. You know, I kind of have the. I know what the end of the story is. So I don't get too worked up. People, I because I know these people, and I'm talking about real believers. They contact me all the time, and they say to me, "Hey, you know, Max." Uh, I'm really frightened for my children and stuff. And I, I'm always, you know, and I talked to you about this many times. I'm always, and people, you know, I'm always comforting them. It's like, you know, you don't really, look, the, God's in control. I mean, he allowed Joe Biden uh, to become president. I, I mean, if I had never, you know, if you want to believe anything, here's what you could take away. I said, this is amazing. The only way, I said this a year ago, the only way Donald Trump would not get reelected is if God prevented it. And boy, I said, there you go. Now, I'm not saying he made the people do uh, do dishonest and corrupt things. He made them do bad or do evil. I'm not saying God does evil. I'm saying he allowed it to happen for a specific reason. And uh, that's a big debate and something I'm probably going to have to uh, uh, actually actually do my own podcast on this whole topic. <laughs> It's because it's like, because, you know, but trying to, because people have been wrestling with this day. Everybody was praying. I know I was, my whole family was, we all felt like the wind was at our backs and then something happened, but nothing ever happens. It's outside of God's control. He's in complete control so of everything that's, Did it for that's, a reason. So that's, that's a really great, uh, probably last question, but I think that's kind of, you know, in the beginning, I asked you about how, you know, people have their evidence what for and against there being a God. And one of the most common things, you know, I hear all the time from people who make the argument that there is no God is that, well, God, there's so much evil in the world and bad things happen all the time. So what would you say, what would your reaction to that be? And why is it what from a believer's perspective, why is it that God does allow such terrible things to happen? Uh, two words, free will. That's yeah. the that's the that's the reason. I'm free will, right? So you know, um, the fact you were talking before we did the program, uh, started mm-hmm. the program, you were talking about something that I have to read up on. I think you know, mm-hmm. you, were, you were discussing that little interesting topic, mm-hmm. and um, but the thing is that free will. Man has fr- man and woman. When I say man, I'm I mean man and woman. Yeah. Humans have free will, yeah. and the Lord the Lord gave us free will he respects mm-hmm. that tremendous he respects that so much that's sacrosanct that is like that is sacred to god god respects and our free will that he will let us kill ourselves and go to hell and he won't and that he is not- where i i say you know when i talk about what is unique about this country uh mm-hmm. the united states of america is we are the only country that you know it is stipulated that we are endowed with free will by our creator yep. You That's know, right. No other nation talks about that, and no other nation, you know, holds that to be sacrosanct. Now, and they very few. They they again, a, a lot of other nations, uh, you know, they're the, they believe that rights stem from government, and this no, we believe they come from God, and right. and the the most important right that a person and has. I, I by the way, I yeah. sorry, so sorry. I just want to clarify: there are other people in the world who may believe that. But there are no other governments that are structured right. around that premise. That's the distinction. Well, I understand what you meant. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I understand what you meant. I just yeah, want to and, clarify and, that for people listening. Because yeah, yeah. I've had people say that to me, really, nobody else. I'm like, well, other people, individuals may believe that. But we're the only government that has been structured around that premise. So. Yeah, and people, and people have free will. So the Lord's not going to make you do good. Right. He's not going to force anyone to do good. If somebody wants to go off and join the mafia and kill people and murder and rape and that's and it's on them. What, what the scripture does say is, if you live by the sword, you'll perish with it. What it does say, it implies over and over again throughout the entire scripture is what goes around comes around. The Japanese call it karma, 
That's mm. the natural way of looking at it, right? Mm. But it's the truth because in nature is the creation of God. It's a byproduct of God. God created nature. So when you study nature, it's no problem. I can't, I see, I, I'm into everything. I'm martial arts and I can reconcile all of this with my faith because I know how to approach it from, from the point of view of the Lord. Mm. He created all of this. So, you know, the Lord gave us the one thing back, free will. And you make up your own mind. So people go, but but he allows evil. If he didn't allow man to make his own mind, we'd be robots. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just, a, and so, and then, well, why do people do evil things is like the, usually the second question or a follow-up question. <laughs> people do evil things because man is full of sin. By man and woman, humans are full of sin. So you go, well, what do you mean they're full of sin? Well, it's called original sin. Catholics, Protestants, even Jews kind of accept it. It's the it's when Adam sinned in the garden, when he ate of the apple and he wasn't supposed to sin entered the world. Death and it actually says death entered the world at that point. So man was then cut off from God. He was now corrupted state and he was going to die it may have taken 900 years because man lived you know the scriptures imply scripture says that he lived to be so old probably i mean i don't you know it's probably i don't want to even speculate as to as to why that was but nevertheless whether it took one day or it took uh 900 years man uh nevertheless um uh, f- uh fell into sin and so his life was 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 cut off at one at some point and uh, and that's why, because of sin, he does he does evil things, and uh, and you know, and some people are 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 better than others as far as there. Some people are I want to say better. I mean, some people are good and some people are bad, and some people are very bad. Some people that's how you end up with an Adolf Hitler. That's how you end up with an industrial nation, uh, actually. Uh, rationalizing the extermination of millions of people, and we're talking about in the last seventy years, a group of people, not a group. An industrial nation, not everybody in it, by the way, but but a, but a, a major, a quote unquote, um, a hyper power or a uh, I don't want to say superpower, but a major power uh, in the world actually was uh, was 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 figuring out how to systematically slaughter and eliminate uh, an entire uh, culture, the Jews, and then of course um, uh, other groups that were undesirable. So you know, and it, it, this is just. You know, and it, how do people do this? Because man's mind can become that twisted and evil, and uh, and uh, you know, I mean, and you, manipulated you, by yeah, evil. Absolutely, because yeah. he's predisposed. It's predisposed in us. Now we could do what's good. We could do what's bad. We have free will. We can make up our own choices. Uh, we can, and no one should try to take away that free will. That's dangerous. Mm-hmm. To ever, they they usually rationalize it will create a utopia on earth. No, all you do is create misery for everyone in the yep. long run. There, you know, there so, is no yeah. utopia. Utopia means nowhere. Yeah. No, so that's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, right. That that that's a whole another topic. Um, I do want to just say I think that all human beings should understand this concept of free will. You know, regardless yeah. of what they what faith they subscribe to, whether they right. believe in religion or not. Um, mm-hmm. You know, this notion of free will is in, integral and intrinsic to humanity, and it is. It is. Yeah. And it's it is. No, I mean, no one should take it away. And when they start doing that social engineering, um, that's what communists do. Right. Yep. That's what they're doing now. And, you know, I mean, uh, and there's no there's no way to create heaven on earth. All you're going to do is create hell on earth for everybody. Yep. Um, you know, I, I think it was Margaret Thatcher. Who, and you can see this on YouTube. Uh, she did that famous thing where she says the, this uh, she's using her hands and she has one higher than the other. And she something about how um, socialism uh, pretty much just brings everybody down to the same level. And she's moving. Yep her higher hand lower and lower and lower and then both hands go down and she goes they everybody ends up at the bottom on, on it's because socialism the goal of socialism is is the communist state that is that's exactly it's of that's course. the specified yeah. goal of it yeah that's stepping the, the, stone to yeah absolutely it's just a tool to to get to communism i'm surprised some of these countries that have subscribed to socialism aren't already communist states i think one of the reasons is because they have this dualistic system exactly. where they allow- they're not really socialistic. Some of them yeah, are socialistic not. in wealth distribution, but they're not socialistic right. in wealth creation. Yeah, exactly. And exactly. they also have, you know, most of these countries that I think you're referring to are, you know, very unique in their population. They're incredibly small, very strict uh, borders. They're very yeah. homogeneous. Uh, you know, very sparsely populated. You know, they have things that make them very unique that would not work 
you know, not to say that I, I advocate for socialism regardless. And as I just said, you know, they're not truly socialistic, um, right. you know, completely. But, you know, it's very different when you're talking about the smaller a, a group that you're governing versus when things become much larger and much more diverse things. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. It's true. It's really true. It's really true. Well, I, listen, I had a really yeah. fun time. I hope I didn't uh, bore you too, too much. Yeah. Of the time. Uh, no, <laughs> this was not boring at all. We'll have, I... a, we'll have to do part three sometime. I don't know. I, I guess uh, we'll have to think of something to do part three on. It would be kind of fun. Yeah, that, so I, I think we already th th thought of a, a part three, but I, I'm open to other topics as well. Um, oh, sure. We were yeah, going to talk about the uh, social media Oh yes, uh, yeah. so do something on social media. That'd be kind of fun. I think we should do. Uh, that's right. I forgot about that. So we have yeah, to do something on social media. Something so. a little bit uh, different, but but thank you so much. Any closing thoughts? And uh, you know, certainly tell everybody where they can find you. I'll have all the links. But you know, did I lose you? Yeah. Hello. Um, at Max, right? Yeah. At Maximus oh. underscore. Can you hear me? Oh yeah, my, now my, I can. My bad. <laughs> Hello. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. sorry about that. No, that's it. Was it was yeah. I was giving me. I'm sorry about that. So, anyways, uh, you can follow me at Twitter at Maximus the num uh, underscore the number four EVR, and then you could also follow me on Parlor at Maximus the number four EVR, and then on Gab, same thing at Maximus as uh, Twitter at Maximus underscore the number four EVR. Um, on Rumble, you can. It's, I think it's uh, Maximus the number four EVR again. I keep it kind of it's more or less the same. Yeah. Uh, YouTube, it's, you, YouTube, it's just Maximus Forever spelled out. Um, I don't do as many podcasts as I should. I'm really busy with my seminars right now. So, you know, yeah. that's the uh, the big thing. I'm, uh, I got my, I think by the time everyone sees this, I'll have already done it, but I've got the big uh, Samurai versus Knight, uh, the uh, Life of a Medieval Warrior uh, this week on the 20. Super the 20 exciting. Night. Yeah, the tw it's, it's going to be interesting. The 29th to the uh, May 1st, it's a big one. And it's actually three three major, three days, three, uh, three different top subtopics, well, actually multiple subtopics, three different uh, themes that I'll be exploring about knights, medieval knights, European knights, and Japanese samurai, contrasting and comparing them. And then, of course, um, uh, and I'll do an encore to that probably in, in, uh, in June. And then um, I have next month in May, May 14th to the 15th, uh, civics maximus 101 the seminar which i know you've taken and then civics mm -hmm. maximus 201 is the following mm -hmm. week i know you'll Ooh. be at that one the 21st and the 22nd so that's going to be fun and then uh i'm going to be doing um 301 which is going to be a discussion on uh and i've done this once before but this one's going to be a little a little different on the history of conservative philosophy in america and that'll be in june that'll be at the ending of June, June, tw I'm, I have it tentatively scheduled for the 29th to the 30th. And then people can reach out to me and do crash courses too. So if you DM me or mm -hmm. what have you, um, or just, you know, tweet at me, I'll see it. Uh, and, and I'll, uh, and I could do crash course. Some people can't make it to the seminars. So I do like little, uh, two, three, two, three hour crash, crash courses with people. Yeah. I do that typically every other month. I did a bunch of them. I did about 16, 17 of them um in in the last couple of weeks but uh, i will do them again probably late may early june again and for people that need uh, that want to get on the they can't make it to the seminars for whatever but go to get to the seminar if you want to learn about civics you want to learn about the constitution take 101 and 201 next month that's really uh those are going to be big they're already a lot of people have already signed up for them so it's going to be a lot of people at those next two so that's really how people can get a hold of me so i'm happy and i try to read my dms you can always dm me my dms usually open so I try to read everyone. I may not be able to reply to everyone, but I try to read everyone. So awesome. Well, thank you. And yeah, we'll schedule part three. Let's do that sometime, Courtney. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. It was a lot such of fun. A, such a pleasure. Thank you. Okay.